This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. Over the past few weeks, the Biden administration has been publicly voicing reservations over the mounting death toll in Gaza, calling on Israel to protect civilians and allow in humanitarian aid. But behind the scenes, the Biden administration has quietly approved and delivered more than 100 separate weapons sales to Israel over the last five months, amounting to thousands of precision-guided munitions, small-diameter bombs, bunker busters, and other lethal aid. This according to a new investigation by The Washington Post. Only two approved foreign military sales to Israel have been made public since the launch of Israel's assault on October 7th, amounting to over $250 million worth of tank shells and ammunition, which the administration authorized using emergency authority to bypass Congress. But in the case of the hundred other weapon sales, known as foreign military sales, the arms transfers were made without any public debate, because each fell under a specific dollar amount that requires the executive branch to individually notify Congress. For more, we're joined by Josh Paul, a veteran State Department official who worked on arms deals and resigned in protest of a push to increase arms sales to Israel amidst its assault on Gaza. Josh Paul is the former director of Congressional and Public Affairs for the Bureau of Political Military Affairs in the State Department, where he worked for 11 years. He's now a non-resident at Dawn. That's Democracy for the Arab World Now. He's joining us from New Haven, Connecticut. Josh, welcome back to Democracy Now! Can you talk about the significance of this Washington Post expose, what we've learned about U.S. flooding Israel with weapons, as President Biden talks about um, saying he's putting pressure on Israel uh, to let food aid in. Thank you, and thank you for having me. I, I think what we've learned from this story uh, shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. Uh, it is that the president continues to facilitate the flow of arms to Israel, despite a change in tone. Uh, you know, we have certainly heard the administration call for more humanitarian assistance for, you know, uh, at least a temporary ceasefire. Uh, but at the same time, it continues to provide the arms that it enable Israel to continue its operations. Uh, so I think that's pretty consistent, frankly, uh, with what the White House has said, including John Kirby from the podium this week, uh, that this remains U.S. policy. Uh, I think many of your viewers may be shocked to hear that there have been 100 sales uh, in the last, you know, few months since October 7th. Uh, but here, I don't think anyone in the State Department will be particularly moved by this story. Uh, much of the process does, unfortunately, move like a production line when it comes to cases that do not require, under law, congressional notification. So what we really have here uh, is both a policy problem, but also a lack of transparency that is built into the system and which can only be remedied by a change in law. Well, let's go to what National Security uh, Communications Advisor John Kirby said. He was questioned at the White House by the journalist Andrew Feinberg, a correspondent for The Independent in Britain. What is preventing the president from communicating to the Israeli government that if they don't allow aid, we will not continue supplying weapons? Why is that not a fair trade? No aid. No bombs. Because the president still believes that it's important for Israel to have what it needs to defend itself against a still viable Hamas threat. Maybe some people have forgotten what happened on the 7th of October, but President Biden has not. So, Josh Paul, your response both to the question and to Kirby's response. I mean, there you have it. And I think the question could also have noted that under U.S. law, uh, under Section 620I of the Foreign Assistance Act, it is actually illegal uh, to provide military assistance to a country that is restricting U.S.-funded humanitarian assistance. And we know that this is the case with Israel because Jake Sullivan himself, the national security advisor, has said that this is a problem. And, of course, we would not be airdropping aid into Gaza uh, were we leaning on Israel to open the humanitarian aid routes. Um, so, you know, I think there is a clear case to be made here that we are not in accordance with U.S. law. Certainly uh, out of step, I think, with international law. And uh, at the same time, the Biden administration position remains. We will continue to provide arms uh, to Israel of whatever it requests and requires. Well, if you could explain, Josh, how much does this differ uh, from the procedure that's been in place uh, regarding U.S. arms transfers to Ukraine? I mean, in this case, as we've said, only two approved foreign military sales to Israel have been made public. What about to Ukraine? 
Yeah, so, so for the most part, the procedures and processes through which we provide arms to Israel versus Ukraine are different. Um, Ukraine requires uh, a, an authorization under presidential drawdown authority, as well as new and uh, you know, novel funding uh, to, for example, the Department of Defense's Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative. Those have expired. Um, we are out of essentially both of those. And so without additional funding, we will not be able to provide arms to Ukraine. Israel, on the other hand, uh, is perfectly capable of using its own money to procure weapons through the foreign military sales system, through the direct commercial sales system, which, by the way, we, the Washington Post didn't, didn't touch on. Uh, and it's quite possible that there's 100 more sales uh, through that other channel that, to Israel that we don't know about. Um, and of course, you know, we are providing Israel with military ground assistance, which it can also tap into and knows it will be able to tap into because it has a 10-year commitment from us to continue providing billions of dollars a year, unlike Ukraine. Um, so it's, it's a slightly different situation and much easier, I think, for Israel to continue to receive weapons even in the absence of a, uh, a supplemental, unlike Ukraine. Democratic Colorado Congress member Jason Crow told The Washington Post the Biden administration should apply, quote, existing standards stipulating that the United States, quote, shouldn't transfer arms or equipment to places where it's reasonably likely that those will be used to inflict civilian casualties or to harm civilian infrastructure. Crow, a former Army Ranger who served in Iraq and Afghanistan, told The Post, I'm concerned that the widespread use of artillery and air power in Gaza and the resulting level of civilian casualties is both a strategic and moral error. Now, Crow is not usually a dove on all of these issues, but it's very interesting to see him talk about um, his response, his critical response to the U.S. when it comes to um, Israel. And this is particularly interesting on the day of President Biden's State of the Union address tonight. We don't know exactly what he's going to say. We know there are a number of Americans um, who have family members who are being held hostage in Gaza. We don't know if the Biden family or the administration will be inviting any Palestinians, uh, and that Biden wanted to be able to announce a ceasefire tonight, which is clear will, it looks like, will not be happening. But your response to all of this and how these weapons sales, do you feel, perpetuate the war? Yeah, I mean, I think that people who have served in the military or worked in the Middle East, people like Representative Crow, also, frankly, like Secretary of Defense Austin, uh, understand that what Israel is doing is not going to lead to, you know, success on Israel's own terms. As Secretary of Defense Austin has said, uh, it will lead to strategic failure. Uh, and that is why I think the same is true on the Israeli side, where you have former heads of Mossad, for example, saying that this is a dead-end road, that what they are doing uh, is damaging to their own interests. Um, but I think that is separate from the political question here. And the political question is one in which we have a president and uh, you know, a, a set of policies and, frankly, a Congress as well, for the most part, that remain set on this course, regardless of the harm it is doing uh, to Israeli security, to American global interests, and, of course, uh, to so many Palestinians. Josh Paul, um, you were in the State Department for 11 years, and you were involved with these kind of arms deals. You resigned in protest uh, of a push to increase arms to Israel. Um, but I wanted to ask you, how much does protest on the ground affect um, what's going on in the State Department, in the White House? How much do you hear it? I mean, there is a massive amount of protest in the United States. And no matter who wants to insulate Biden from it, almost everywhere he goes, he is hearing the chance of ceasefire. I mean, tonight, one of his guests will be the UAW president, um, Sean Fain. The UAW was one of the early unions to call for a ceasefire. How much does it matter? I, I think protest is very important. I think particularly protest when it manifests at the ballot box in terms of, for example, the uncommitted vote or the other vote uh, that we have seen in states and will continue, I hope, to see uh, in the coming days, because that signals to the Biden administration that they really have a political problem here. Uh, and that is really one of the only means we have uh, of getting this administration to change course in the time that it has left. Uh, so I think that is very important. I think it's most important when it manifests directly in the political process and when it comes with organization. I think there is a momentum around this issue now, and we have to maintain that momentum for the, frankly, months and years ahead, because this is not going to be 
a, a long-term pull to shift uh, where American policy is and has been for many years. Finally, you were inside for years, uh, the State Department. And now that you've resigned, and we sort of ask you this every time since then, how many people inside the administration have reached out to you? Do you feel that that's increasing? And how many times do they tell you that they've been discussing this with Biden or the inner circle of Biden and what their views on this are? I mean, Biden was no fan of Netanyahu um, from the beginning. And so yet he is embracing him now, what they are saying. Yeah, I mean, I'm still hearing from people I had not heard from previously, to be clear, uh, who are saying that, you know, this is not working. I'm, I feel sick to my stomach of being involved in this. Um, and I, you know, I'm trying to do to make changes and it's just not working. Uh, I had several of those conversations just in the last week with people I've not spoken to before on this issue. So I think the internal pressure, the internal disgust, frankly, uh, is still there. Uh, but I think, you know, the White House and the president have, you know, su surrounded the president with, you know, a council of advisors who are, for the most part, like minded with him. Uh, and I don't know how much of that dissent is, is actually breaking through. And even if it did, uh, how much it would change the, the president's decision making. Uh, I think he is where he is. And, uh, you know, absent, you know, significant political pressure, uh, that is not going to change, unfortunately. Josh Paul, we want to thank you for being with us. Veteran State Department official, worked on arms deals, resigned in protest of a push to increase arms sales to Israel and its siege on Gaza. He's the former director of Congressional and Public Affairs for the Bureau of Political Military Affairs in the State Department, where he worked for 11 years. Now a non-resident fellow with Dawn. That's Democracy for the Arab World Now.